So I have helped companies save more than 250,000 euros on labeling efforts because I've seen that it's something that is not specifically pinpointed or locked and it's important to have the right approach. So why do we label the data? Basically today, having the ability to have large data sets which are labeled, where we know what is what for a specific application, this is a gold mine. And this is something that a lot of companies, especially in the geospatial domain or for autonomous driving or for robotics, having this data with this specific label is super useful to create supervised learning model that performs really well. The problem is, of course, we need a lot of data and getting there often means getting into manual labeling effort. And this is really painful. So I decided to pinpoint a bit what I've seen through consulting various companies and helping them establish clear workflows to save them hours and hours of manual labeling time, which means a lot of money saved. So the main aspect of things is that, okay, we have a 3D data set. This is what I focus on, 3D data set. Whereas it's a point cloud, a 3D mesh, a 3D voxel assembly or a beam model. It's a 3D data set. I decompose what is geometry from the other attributes. Okay, the base from all of that is geometric entities. It can be a point, it can be a triangle, it can be a facet, whichever entity makes sense to you. So this is what you have. You, ha you collected this data set and it has no labels. So what do you do? You cannot go directly to supervised learning approaches because you need labels. So either you take this data and you have someone or a team label that manually, which is super time consuming, or you're trying to find strategies. And that's where I want to highlight uh, what is feasible today. The first strategy is to go into unsupervised learning approach. So basically using some kind of segmentation or clustering technique to try and group points that make sense together in order to extract uh, relevant clusters and then maybe just label these clusters. That's one approach. Um, to extend from that, you have the so-called future learning capabilities as well, or you have the ability to extract semantics directly from the data itself. If you can plug something that resonates or reasons based on this cluster or these features. So this is one way to go. Another way is to use active learning. And this is what it means in the title. Active learning is the process to involve a human in the feedback loop, which will do some labeling, but very tiny labeling process. So how does that work? And that's what I want to emphasize today, because this is something very powerful. And I've seen results where you just need to label 2% of the data set and you will still have a model that performs super nicely. So let's take, for example, this data set that you can see here. This is a beautiful data of an indoor office uh, of a university in Munich. And the idea is how can you get from that data set to a fully labeled data set as quickly as possible if you are starting from scratch, of course. Uh, if you already have some kind of data, that would be a good process to just use that and leverage it. So how do you do that? Well, you have a lot of ways uh, as we've seen, and I just want to highlight active learning. And to do that with active learning, basically we'll go into a nine stage process. So the first one is to go through tiny sample and manual labeling. So what we do here is we begin by manually labeling a tiny proportion of the data set. So if you take um, a lot of rows, you would take like one or 2% of this row here. I exaggerated. I took more than that. And you label that with either an unsupervised approach or let's make it simple manually. Okay and all the rest is the remaining element. So this is the first stage. The second stage is to actually initiate a model, initialize a model based on the label data, which will con constitute your training uh, data set. So you just use that and you train a model that we will use later on. So as you can expect, because you have a very limited amount of samples of um, observation, the model performances will not be uh, their peak, but you still will have something which will definitely be overfitting, but it's okay at this stage, all right? So you have your model now. What do we do? Naturally, we have the model, we use the remaining point that we did not label, and that's the, the, the third stage, let's say, where we actually fit the model to this enabled data set uh, to have the probabilities, so the scores from that. And this will generate, and this is the fourth step, we will generate prediction scores. This prediction scores is very important that we tune it so that we have probabilities for each of our classes. 
What that means is that we need to have a probabilistic model down the line. You have some, uh, not all models are there are probabilistic, but it's usually a good thing to use one of them, one which is probabilistic, to have this kind of uh, confidence interval. And having this confidence levels, like for example, you take this point cloud and you have this cluster and you will have as an output, I'm 76% confident that this is a chair or I'm 5% confident that this is a chair, right? And this is then the step five, we go into ranking. What we do is for each of the confidence level, we will rank our prediction based on this level. This means that actually all the highest prediction will be above and all the lowest scores will be below. And this is where it will be very interesting because in step six, what we do is we actually select the low confidence, all right? So where the model was really not pertinent, and we'll pass that to the human labeling effort, maybe not all on the first pass, but some of them, and we'll ask the human to label that, all right? So this is where the manual effort comes in, only at this stage. Usually, you could establish some kind of labeling process in your organization or in your research, and just using that, it will be super efficient to get much quicker at having something that is, uh, let's say, squared and well-controlled. All right, so after having selected and gone through this labeling effort, the next stage, step seven, is actually to um, concatenate the initial labeled data set, so the seed data, with the newly labeled low-level confidence interval, and that's constitute your new data set, all right? And what do we do with that? Well, it's very simple, is we do as we did before, we then pass that to a model and we train a model based on this new data set. Okay, that's the iteration two. And basically, the final stage is just to iterate, and you iterate, and you iterate, and every time your training data set grow and grow and grow, at the point that at, at, at some point you will have a threshold, a quality threshold for your application, it may be I want to have this class at least at a 90% F1 score, or it could be I want to be sure for all classes I have a 60 or 70% recall, right? So Whichever your goal is, the idea is to go as close as possible, if not go beyond this goal, in order to stop the active learning process. And I've seen and established some kind of um, workflow where you can actually distribute that or crowdsource this labeling effort if it's well uh, organized. So this is a strategy that I highly encourage you to try. Um, because it's super, super powerful and it limits a lot the labeling effort. And I've seen um, like companies that went from huge amount of money spent on labeling platform and labeling effort to just a few thousand bucks to do just what is really, really important and all the rest internally. But there is all, all, always a but. Um, let me just explain something very quickly. There are some things that you need to be careful when you generate this confidence measure. If they are not relevant, you will mess up and it will affect every subsequent step. So this confidence measure should be super relevant. And there is also another thing in active learning that I uh, did not spoke about, and maybe you hinted that, is that when you combine low confidence data with the seed, uh, we could also include the high confidence data, right? We did not do that here, to be simple. But when we do that, actually, this is a subcategory of um, active learning, which is called cooperative learning. And this may be for another time. And the latest stuff that I wanted to pinpoint is that um, whenever you have a very clear decision boundary, right, between some data points, um, between two classes, for example, and if you want to predict what this point or this point is, naturally it's very clear to see where the data are close to the boundary, which is a bit hard to uh, classify where the human should be, right? So this is it. Now you know how to leverage active learning to increase your outcomes from a labeling effort and to reduce to the minimum how much effort you actually put into labeling your data sets. In another session, I will put that all hands on, but I really wanted to have one clear episode just dedicated to active learning to make sure that you understand that you know it exists and that it's not so complicated. There are just a structure to put in place. And then once that is there, the rest is usually a piece of cake, if I may. So. If you like this kind of video, I'm not asking anything except if you want to see this channel grow or if you want more, uh, just show some support and uh, put just down below what you would like me to talk about next. And I will try to do my best to address these topics so that you can grow into your practice with 3D data and AI. 
Have a great learning journey. Bye-bye.